This is a message where we can't quite jump in. Uh, if you missed last week, then I need to go back and grab you and bring you forward just a little bit. It's not a complicated message uh, at all. Today is a very simple message. I'm going to review a little bit from last week, but don't tune that out because it's good stuff that I want to say and I want you to hear. And then we're going to introduce kind of this new thing uh, at the end. But heaven is this word. It's an important word. It represents eternity. And I, I think that when you mention heaven, a lot of people have a lot of different thoughts and emotions about it. They have a lot of things that come to mind. Uh, so like when I was young, when I was a little kid, maybe like six, maybe seven years old, I had a Sunday school teacher who was teaching about heaven. And in a good Southern Baptist church, the way that he was presenting heaven, I, I made the decision that I don't want to go there. Because he said that heaven was you open up your hymnal and you turn to page you know, 294 and you sing the first and third stanza and you wear all white and you would stand there and just praise God all day long, 24-7. And as a little seven-year-old, I thought, well, that sounds horrible, you know. I want to play soccer. I want to eat cake. I want to do all these other things. And so f for me at that time, heaven wasn't super attractive. Fortunately, my view on it has changed now. I definitely, definitely want to go there. But for a lot of people, it brings different feelings, different emotions. Uh, for some people, they don't believe in it at all. When you die, when you close your eyes, poof, you're gone. You go to dust. That's it. I, I mean, I, I could not imagine that. But even the people that believe that way, I, I think deep down inside, they want to have an eternity. They really do. So my grandfather on his deathbed, he, he spent his entire life saying that there was no heaven, there was no God. He didn't believe in any God. And he spent his entire life just determined there is no God. And you people that are following a God or any God, Christian, Muslim, whatever, didn't matter to him. It was a waste of time. And he had cancer. He was in the hospital. And we were all very worried for him, stressed for him, because we knew that he didn't know Jesus. He didn't believe in a heaven. And we called our, our pastor, a guy named Dr. Chris Stevens. And he came in at the, like the 11th hour, literally. The nurses told us, the doctor told us, it's not a matter of days, it's a matter of hours. And he walked right into that room. And with the authority of God, he just said, less in a couple hours, you're going to find out what's next. Do you want to go to heaven or not? And right there, I watched that old, grumpy, broken man soften and say, please, please give me the security. And so he led him to Christ right there. Now, I just use that as an example to, to show you that at the end of the day, I think, I think everybody wants an eternity. So we ask this question, okay, this whole message is kind of based on this preconceived notion that you want to go to heaven. Or if you're not a Christ follower and you believe in some other good place, you want to go to the good place at the end of this life. So who goes there? Who is it that gets to go there? Easy way to answer that question. Good people go to heaven. This is a great, this is a great way to answer that question. And furthermore, because good people go to heaven, I could even say that like, hey, I'm a good person. So if good people go to heaven and I'm a good person, then that means that I get to go to heaven. And that's a great way because that, that puts the control in our hands. It means that we get to decide or we get to make decisions and this is what qualifies me for good. And so this is why I get to, I get to go to heaven. And, you know, I, I've heard that it's also, it's not offensive. It's kind. It's a good blanket statement. Like it's a good, what I call like Oprah statement. Anybody ever watch Oprah Winfrey? Yeah, there's like one person in here. It's great. You and me, we connect, you know, after school at four o'clock, you know, I would turn Oprah on. But an Oprah answer is like an unoffensive answer. So, hey, who gets to go to heaven? Well, good people get to go to heaven. Oh, it's amazing. Everybody gets a new car, you know. That's the way that she did things. So, so uh, that's, that, that's a great way, to, great way to put it, you know. Good people get to go to heaven, and I'm a good person. And it's got even more advantages than that. It's got qu quite a few. So... This theory, and I'm going to call it a theory, the first advantage to it is that it's just. It's fair. It's, a fa it's very fair. Because if you're good, you should go to the good place. If you're bad, you go to the bad place. Good people don't go to the bad place, and bad people don't get to go to the good place because it's a just and fair system. That, that just makes sense. Now, the second advantage is that, hey, you make the cut. No matter how bad you are, 
Most people, most, 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 99% of people believe that ultimately deep down inside, they're good. You know, even when you do bad things, you're, you're, you think, uh, you know what, actually, I, I really am a good person. You know, if you have a hard time believing that about yourself, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I know that there are people out there, I've been there before, where I thought there is no good in me. I'm not a good person at all. But generally, we think that we are good people. We do. And so that makes it kind of easy because then no matter what we do wrong, we can examine our own heart and say, yeah, I messed up. I made decisions. It was their influence, their fault, or I was born disadvantaged, or I grew up in a rough area. But deep down inside, I I am a good person. So you kind of qualify yourself. And this third advantage, I think this one's great here because it supports the notion of a good God. So it's self-supporting. So think of it this way. It's a circle. So God is a good God. Because God is a good God and I'm a good person, I get to go to the good place. I go to the good place because God's a good God. God's good because I'm good and therefore I go to the good place. It's just a self-supporting circle there. Like, yeah, if I'm good, I get to go to heaven. I get to go to the good place. Now, I call this a theory. And there is a problem, a big problem with the good people go to heaven theory. I call it a theory because no one good has gone to heaven and come back and said, here's the version of good that you need to be in order to get to heaven. I I don't know of a single person, maybe some people that got really creative and wanted to write a book and suck a bunch of people in. They said, I went to heaven and this is what it's like and, you know, and and all that. But it's that no one has been there. And come back and said, here's what it means to be good. So it's, it's therefore, it's a theory. So if you believe the rest of this message or most of this message is built on you believing or having an understanding or grasping the concept or, or, or definitely believing that good people go to heaven. So whether you've believed it or whether you know somebody that has believed it, that's where we're going to start from today. Now, I'm also assuming that you want to go to heaven. Or I could make the, I, or we could even make it even easier and say that at the end of your life, when you close your eyes, you don't want that to be the end. You hope that there's something better on the other side. And so this theory of, okay, well, good people go to heaven, unfortunately, here's the problem with it, is it's got a reality that comes with it, and that reality is unsettling. It's going to bother you. It's going to unwind your theory a little bit. So I'm going to introduce some logic to you with a little bit of Scripture. There's going to be one Bible part, but the rest of it is just, it's just good logic. So if you believe that good people go to heaven, it's a theory because no one's been and come back. But there are some realities that you have to deal with. And these realities... Are, are, are not biblical realities. They're logical realities, but it's going to unwind your theories. Hey, let me, instead of talking about it, let me just show you. So the first unsettling reality, and hey, last week I had five. This week I've only got, I think, three for you, but I decided to spare you. This week, number one, good is a moving target. So what that means is there is no indisputable, standard, generational, multicultural, multigenerational standard of what good is. It doesn't exist. There's nothing, because if you were to sit down and you were to make a list of, this is what I believe it is to be good. This is what it means to be a good person. Well, I could probably take your list and I could take it to another generation, either before you or after you, and people could say that, no, 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 that's not good, that's not good, that's not good. Instead, these things are what's good. Or I could take your good list and take it to another culture or another place. And they could say, yeah, no, these aren't good. Instead, these things are good. You know, it's, it, there's no standard list. It really relies on the fact that you think that it's good. You know, I, I know cultures, I grew up uh, as a young kid in the south, southeast in, uh, in America. I lived in Tennessee, but way deep down in Tennessee and Georgia and South Carolina, you unfortunately, you have people that had a hard time kind of letting go of, of the, the, the transformation that happened with slavery and stuff. And so you just have a small percentage of people that make a lot of noise 
And if we called those people like white supremacists, I know that's a very general term, but, and again, I'm speaking just from my context. So if they made a good list and they believed it wholeheartedly, does that mean that they get to go to heaven because they're good? Because if you take their good list and you put it in your hands, then you'd say, no, this isn't good. Or if I took your good list and I put it in their hands, they'd say, this isn't good. So there's no standard. There's no standard. And if there's no standard, then that leaves us to decide what's good and what isn't good. And that doesn't work. You know, this is the part where I want to bring a little bit of the Bible into this, and then we'll go back to logic. But the truth to this, if we're talking about standards, is that you, you just you don't make the cut. You think you do, but you don't. And here's what our God, our Jesus, our Word, our Bible, says about you, about me, about everybody. It says this in Romans 3.10. It says, As it is written and forever remains written, there is none. So none, no one. There's no Chris, no uh, Casey, my wife, uh, no you, no your neighbor, no your partner, no one. There's no one that is righteous. That means none that meets God's standard. Not even one. So doesn't matter what generation, what age, what stage, which culture, which geographical location, there is no one that meets the standard of God. No one that is good enough. In Romans uh, 3.23, it says, Since all, that's everybody, believe it or not, that's even you, all have sinned and continually fall short of the glory of God. This word continually, it's in there for a reason. It means that you're never going to stop falling short of the glory of God. You're never going to stop sinning. You're never going to stop being not good enough. It's a continuous thing. So that's, that's what the Bible says about you. You don't actually make the cut. Sounds like the Bible's a great book, right? Let's all go read the book that tells me how bad I am and the fact that I'll never be righteous or come to God, you know? Uh, we'll get to that later, but let's go back to logic a little bit. So the second unsettling reality for us is we don't know what percent of our actions have to be good to make the cut. What is it? If you're 51% good, does that mean you go to heaven or the good place? If you're 49%, does that mean you go to the bad place? What if you're 51% and then you do a bad thing? Does it knock you down to 49%? When does it start counting? Does it start when you're 18? Does it start when you're 16? Does it start when you're like a little kid? Does it start when you're a baby? When does it start? How do we know? We don't know. There's way, 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 way too much uncertainty into this. Because if you're going to say that good people go to heaven, and I've heard this at funerals, I hate hearing it at funerals, not hate from a place of like hate, anger, Hate from a place of like mourning, like sad, you know, where someone says that, oh, you know, they were such a good person. I'm sure that they're up above and they're looking down, smiling down on us. And I, I always think, I hope they are. You know, I'm going to hopefully assume that they are. But good is not what got you there. Because what's the definition of good? They were good, so now they're looking down on us. But what's good? We don't know. And we don't know what percentage of it is. And we don't know when the percentage starts to build up and when it starts to matter, when it starts to take effect. And then even just tied in with this right here is number three, the third unsettling reality is that we don't know if thoughts and motives count against us. What if you do something that's good but with bad motives? Does that still count? Does that count for a positive or for a negative? Or what do you do? Uh, if it, what happens if you do something bad but you have the right motive? You know, if you rob a bank, but you give all the money to poor people, you know, if you're a Robin Hood, does that make you, does that count for good or does that count for bad? Maybe to you it counts for good, but to someone else it counts for bad. The, the point that I want to make here is this. If you are going to believe that you have to be good to go to the good place, then you also have to deal with the enormous amount of unsettled, uh, unspoken for, unobtainable sort of like guarantee. There is a lot of uncertainty, a lot of uncertainty to good. There's so much uncertainty. There's, there's no definition 
of what is good and what counts for good. There's just too much uncertainty. You know, we, we can't even make a decision around whether or not it counts if you have good motives or bad motives. We, we don't even know, is it, you know, is it 90%, 95%? Maybe it's 99%. You know, m- maybe, it's, maybe it's 51% and you get three days, uh, you, you finally make it. It takes you 10 years to go from 49% to 51%. And then something happens and you cuss somebody out or you yell at somebody and it drops you back down to 49% and then you get hit by lightning and you're dead. What happens then? You know, what, there's just too much uncertainty to this. And so that brings us to a question here. The the self-supporting argument of God is good, so good people go to heaven. Good people go to heaven because it's a good place and because God is good. But this sort of breaks that mold down. It makes us think, okay, maybe God is not good. And here's the truth. God's not good. He's not the kind of good that you want him to be. He's not the kind of good that you think he is. We take for granted that God is good because... Why, why would we preach or teach or advertise a God that wasn't good? You know, God's just not the same kind of good that you think that he is or you think he should be. He's not the same kind of good that you hope he is. We hope that God is the version of good that allows us to be good enough to go to the good place. But that's not the way that God works. So that leaves some of us angry. And I want to recognize those of you that feel this way. It leaves us a little bit frustrated with God. And it's okay to be frustrated with God about this. Let's just be honest. Be open about it. You know, be like, well, wait a minute. I still can't let go of the fact that how could God not be, how could it be so bad? How could God be so bad to not tell me, to not lay it out for me? And so you, you get left with this statement here. It's, you know, we're supposed to be good. So we can go be with a good God who never defined the terms and failed to tell us how good is good enough. That, that's, that's a place where a lot of people get stuck. It is. I hope today maybe to help you get unstuck from this a little bit. But we're supposed to be good. So we can be with a good God who never defined the terms. And he failed to tell us, to tell me, to tell you... How good is good enough? That's the problem. That's one of the the problems with the good people go to heaven theory. Is if you can't define good, then we're left trying to reconcile with a God like this. And then furthermore, there's another problem. Another big problem. This is where we introduce, where I'm going to talk with you about some new stuff today. If only good people go to heaven, then we have a problem with Jesus. Yes, we have a major problem with Jesus. If, if, if we believe that only good people go to heaven, then Jesus was like a heretic. Because see, Jesus was mistaken. He taught the wrong things or, or, or he didn't understand. Je- Jesus did not understand how to get to heaven. Jesus was misleading because he, he, didn't get, he, he didn't teach this. He didn't teach that good people go to heaven. In fact, Jesus was then misled even. You know, he, he didn't figure it out. See, if, if you take this idea that all you have to be is good, then that leaves you having to deal with an enormous amount of uncertainty. That leaves you having to explain Jesus and everything that he did and everything that he taught. See, we think that it makes it easier. If I can be good, then I can go to the good place. I can go to heaven. We think that that's easy. Because it puts it in our hands. It puts it in our control. We get to define it. We get to make the decisions about it. But then when you start to scratch below the surface, we, we find that there's some major, major problems here. Think about an M&M. Who likes M&Ms? There's a few honest of us in here, you know. M&Ms are something you buy two packs of. One pack to eat on the way to the car and then one pack to eat in the car. Right? Some people are like, yeah, okay. That's who really likes M&M's. So if you take an M&M, beautiful candy-coated M&M, and instead of it being filled with chocolate, it's being filled with dirt. And you take that M&M, and it looks good, and it looks great. It's got this candy-coated shell. It looks great. looks like the rest of them. You pop it in your mouth. You take a bite, and you realize, ah, oh, there's a problem here. I have a problem with what's happening in my mouth. That's kind of the way the good people go to heaven 
theory is. Looks great on the outside. Looks appealing. Looks like something I want to buy into. But just below the surface, it's got some major problems. In fact, when it comes to Jesus here, Jesus wasn't mistaken. He wasn't misled. He wasn't misleading because Jesus did not teach that good people go to heaven. Nowhere. Nowhere in the Bible did Jesus teach good people go to heaven. People tried to come to Jesus. The, the rich young ruler went to Jesus and said, Hey, Jesus, how do I go to heaven? How do I enter into salvation? How do I get what's next in this life? How do I follow you? I want to follow you. And he says, Sell everything you have. Just sell it all and then come follow me. The guy says, Well, he can't do it. See, Jesus never teaches that it's about being good enough. He doesn't give a standard of good enough. In fact, he does the opposite to this. He never taught that good people go to heaven. Did you know that in the Old Testament, sort of a side fact here, that the Old Testament never mentions heaven? Never. There's no uh, theology around heaven in the Old Testament. That comes when Jesus enters in. And Jesus never, ever, ever taught that good people to go to heaven. Instead, Jesus raised the standard for good. He raised it so that the, the standard for good, uh, good enough was so high. In fact, if you look at uh, texts, if you were to open the Bible, go to Google, type in Sermon on the Mount, and pull that scripture up and read the Sermon on the Mount. You, it, Christian, non-Christian, whatever, just read it. And when you read it, you're going to think like, I can't, I can't meet all this. It's, it's Jesus purposefully to a crowd setting a standard that nobody can obtain, that nobody at all can reach. In fact, Jesus purposefully set out to create a standard that was so high that everybody would fall short. So what's that mean for us? It means that we are all doomed, all of us. No one goes to heaven. Have a great Sunday. See you guys next week, you know? <laughs> No one goes to heaven because no one's good enough. We're all doomed. And Jesus went through great effort to make sure that you know how doomed that you are. He had several principles that he would use to kind of level the playing field. Because maybe even though he makes sure that there's a high standard, there are people that are delusional enough to say, well, I do meet that standard. We know some of those people. You know, they think, okay, you know what, I, but I, I do all that. I, am, I, like, I don't ever do anything wrong. You know, and, and so Jesus said, okay, here's the deal. I'm going to lay a couple things out there for you to make sure that you all know that you're doomed, no matter how good that you think that you are. And one of those is this right here. Jesus rejected this religious notion. I love that this religious is in there. I'll tell you why in just a second. This religious notion that you could be okay with God while mistreating someone that God loves. Look how cool Jesus is. I think this is so cool because I'm, I, I'm a little bit of like an anti-establishment, yeah, down with the man kind of thing. And Jesus is saying here, like Jesus rejected the religious notion because Jesus knew that the biggest kind of the people that were guilty of this the most was the church. It was the people in the church. It was, it was the Jewish leaders, the Jewish teachers, that they felt like, okay, we're following all the laws, all the Jewish laws. We have them memorized. In fact, we're professional law keepers. We walk around and make sure that everyone else is following the laws because you have to follow the law to be in right standing with God. And Jesus is saying this religious idea that you could be right with God and mistreat someone else, that actually doesn't work here. And that doesn't exist. That's not on here. So guess what that means? Even those of you that can keep all 459 laws that were added to the Ten Commandments, even you are not good enough. Even you are doomed. So the question that I have for you is, have you ever mistreated another person? And it, it, I don't... Some of you have bullied people. You've beaten people up. Some of you have mistreated people in your own heart, you know, in your own mind. There's a few people in my world, none of you guys here, I promise, a few people that when I think about their name, I'm like, Arr. you know, it just makes me like, just gets me grumpy, you know. That, that's me, honestly, 
that's me mistreating that person. You know, have you ever been jealous of somebody? Have you ever been envious of them? Have you ever wished that you had what they had? Have you ever been mad that they had more than you had or they had something that you wanted? Have you ever just been, uh, have you ever felt justified? Maybe somebody else is so bad and so mean that you feel justified that you can say whatever you want to to them or about them. Or maybe they've hurt you. They've done something to mistreat you. And so you feel like, well, you know what? I can return that. Or I can go and tell a whole bunch of people how bad this person is. You know, all that stuff is still, whether it's justified or not, is still mistreating another person. Here's what happens. This is Jesus so brilliantly lays this out. because He wants to level the playing field for everybody including the Jewish leaders, including the Pope, including every pastor that gets on every stage around the world, every single Sunday, Jesus is leveling the playing field. Because when you sin against someone that God loves, you sin against God. Let me explain this example to you. If you come up to me and you say something about my wife... You say, you know, uh, it's great to see you, Chris. You should come over and hang out. Like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, I'll check with Casey, and, you know, we'll figure out a time where we can get together. Casey's our family manager. She kind of manages the family schedule. And they said, well, you know, actually, I was wondering if just you could come because I don't really like your wife. Like, she kind of like, you know, she speaks out of turn. She speaks out of place, you know. Some of you guys just mistreated the fictional person that I was talking about. You're like, how dare somebody say something like that? But if you were to say something like that to me, we're not going to have lunch together. You're not going to be my buddy. If you mistreat one of my children, if you treat them bad or speak badly about them or you start a rumor or whatever it is, you mistreat one of my children and we are not okay, nor will we be okay. Nor, you know, I can love you in Jesus' name, but you are not coming into this family unit. If you mistreat them, then you and I have a problem. See, God could do the same thing because God loves everyone. If you're good enough for God to love, then everyone else is good enough for God to love. And so every single person that you mistreat, you are mistreating and sinning against God because God, God loves them. And if you mistreat them, then how can you be right with God? See, when you sin against someone that God loves, then you sin against God. That's all of us. That sort of levels the playing field for us. So, have you ever mistreated another person? And the answer to that is yes. Now, this brings us to a part in our journey where We're left so far on this kind of cliffhanger, which I would consider bad news. So this is where some of your story ends. Because you don't, either you don't know or you don't believe or you have not had the opportunity to know and understand and believe in Jesus. And to believe in what he continued to teach about you and about eternity and about love. And if that's you, then your journey stops here and it stops on bad news. And I think that part of what Christ was trying to do is Christ was trying to bring you to a place of, of not feeling bad, but a place of like reality. Some of us need that, that reality check, that awakening, that kind of like, hey, here's actually the way the world works here, buddy. It, you're left here with bad news. Christ came in and Christ didn't intervene in our life because we were sitting on good news. Christ came in and intervened in our life because we're sitting on bad news. So if we go all the way back to the beginning... Heaven, who goes there? It kind of uh, makes me ask a question. Okay, well, how good is good enough? Because we've been talking about good people go to heaven. But now the Bible's saying that good people don't go to heaven. But maybe there's a level of perfect. There's a level of sin-free. I don't know. I, I, still, I still have to think that there's some version of something that gets into heaven. And it turns out it's not a level of perfection, it's not a level of sin-free, and it's not a list. Instead, it's Jesus. It's a person. It's the person of Jesus. See, when, when sin was introduced into the world, Adam and Eve, they sinned, and that has carried down generation after generation after generation. 
And that comes down to us. All of us are sinners. Jesus made it very clear, remember? We just talked about it, that everyone in this room is a, a sinner. I told the first service that they were fine and that you guys were the sinners. So I want to tell you guys that you guys are fine and the first service is full of a bunch of sinners. But actually, you're all sinners, first service, second service, doesn't matter when you come. Uh, even if you do come, we're all sinners. And Jesus made every effort for you to understand that. That's why he wanted you to know that you're doomed. It's because you are a sinner. You will never be good enough. But Jesus, Jesus is how we get there. Because here's what Jesus does. Jesus is the only one good enough to do what we couldn't do for ourselves. He died for our good. See, Christ offers us salvation. We, we can't die for our own good. If you think you can die for your own good when you die, that's, I mean, it's it. It's over. You're either going to a good place, bad place, but there's no self-sacrifice to get to the good place. Jesus was the only one to do that. that. That's why there is no good enough. Instead, there is just Jesus enough. In 2 Corinthians 5.20, let me just show you how great this is here. We, as Christ's representatives, plead with you. So consider me, he's talking about Paul and his friends, but, you know, Pastor Chris here and, and Casey here on the front row and our elders and, and the great people in this room, you know, we are pleading with you on behalf of Christ. That's on behalf of the truth of Christ, the teaching of Christ, the love of Christ, the death of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. On behalf of all of that, I want you to be reconciled to God. I do. That's why I'm preaching about heaven two weeks in a row. I want you to be reconciled to God. I want God to see you as perfect. I want you to have the opportunity to join God. I don't want you to live a life far from God. And so I, I, as, as us just wanting that for you, and in verse 21, Paul goes on, and I would go on and say, hey, he made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on your behalf, so that in him we could become the righteousness of God. So that means that through Christ, I get to become the righteousness of God. See, if, if all Jesus, if, if all it took was good, and all it took was good enough, all it took was perfect enough, if all it took was to never sin, then Jesus did not need to go to the cross. Because he was sin-free, he never did anything wrong, and he's the closest definition that we could have to being good enough. But for some reason, he still had to go to the cross. See, even Jesus' good enough was not enough to cover my lack of good. Jesus wasn't good enough for me to not be good enough. See, it's not good people don't go to heaven. Good people do not go to heaven. Instead, forgiven people go to heaven. And forgiven people go to heaven because a good Jesus who lived a perfect life, a sinless life, the one person on earth that never mistreated anyone, it's not that he was perfect that gets us into heaven. It's not that he was perfect that makes me right. It's that he was sacrificed. And in that moment of sacrifice, he did something just incredibly selfless and incredibly special for you, for your eternity. In Luke 23, it says to us, it says, when they came, they came to the place of the skull, they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. Jesus, perfect, the perfect man, the sinless man, the good enough man was put on a cross. And in his last moments, he says in verse 34, he says, and Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them. Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. They don't know. We don't know. We don't know what we're doing. We th we're trying to find a way to get to heaven. We're trying to find a way to justify good enough or bad enough. But even Jesus didn't use good enough. Instead, Jesus used forgiven enough, sacrificed enough. And so today, well, let me ask you a question this morning, assuming that you want to go to heaven. I hope that you do. I hope that just even just the idea that you, know, you don't understand heaven, but it's a better place than the bad place. 
So maybe you want to go to the better place than the bad place. So the question is, is what would you be trusting in to get you into heaven? Would you be trusting in good enough? Because that's pretty dangerous. You know, would you be trusting in uh, your definition of good enough, someone else's definition of good enough? Do you want to be stubborn and say, you know what, I I know that I'm good enough. I know that that's fine. I I know, I know, I know, I know. Remember all that uncertainty that comes with that? Or how about this? If you have even an ounce of uncertainty in you, if you've even just got a little bit, but you don't understand any of this Christ stuff, this church stuff, this heaven stuff, but you've just got a little bit of uncertainty. Do you want to trust that uncertainty? Or would you rather trust in something else? Would you rather trust in forgiven enough? You could trust in good enough. I'd rather trust in forgiven enough. Because I don't have to do anything except just accept forgiven enough. But to do a whole bunch of work to try and be good enough, even though I don't know what is good enough, I, that's not for me. And I don't think that that's for you either. And so when we talk about this transfer of trust from good enough to forgiven enough, what we're saying is, is what I'm saying to you, I'm pleading with you. Hey, will you transfer your trust from your effort, which is good enough, trying to be good enough, to his sacrificial death for you, which is forgiven? Will you be forgiven and transfer your trust into his forgiveness? Because he did for you what you could never do for yourself. You know, 1 Corinthians 15, it just talks about the good news that is this salvation that Jesus is offering. Now, brothers and sisters, let me remind you once again of the good news of salvation, which I preached to you, that Christ died for our sins. Now, put the verse up there. That Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he was bodily raised on the third day. This is how we answer the question, heaven, who goes there? It's those of us that recognize that without Jesus, we're never good enough, but with Jesus, we are forgiven enough. And so I've got a a prayer for us. I'm going to give you that opportunity today. I, I call this a prayer of salvation. It's not the prayer that gets you into heaven or the prayer that secures your eternity, but it is a prayer that leads you and guides you and gives you the words to say that can Uh, impact your heart and kind of pull your heart towards this. If you can find it in you to believe this and to receive this, well, then you can stop trying to answer the question of, am I good enough? Because you've accepted that now you're forgiven enough. And so what I want to do is something a little bit different. I want to read this out loud. I want all of us to read it out loud. And the reason I want to do it different today is that those of us that that we know that we're Christ followers, we know that we've given Jesus our heart, and we know that we've accepted, you know, forgiven enough for us, I think there's still a lot of power in saying it. And when you say it, and you're reminded of it, and when it means something, you know, it just reinvigorates you. So I want this to just reinvigorate a truth in you. And then if you don't know Christ, you're not a Christ follower, you've never given Jesus your life, then maybe you can be encouraged by those around you that are saying it, that you can take courage, and you can say it and claim it for yourself. So I'm going to lead us in this prayer, and I just want you to uh, pray along with me. You don't have to repeat after me, but I'm going to read a nice slow cadence, and you just pray it with me. So here we go. Heavenly Father, I have mistreated people you love. I have sinned. I don't need to do better. I need forgiveness. I need a Savior. I accept Jesus as my Savior. I'm no longer trusting in my goodness. I'm trusting in your undeserved goodness to me. I accept Jesus' death as the once and all payment for my sin. Amen.